Right, our next speaker is Mr. Daniel Kish. Daniel has been completely blind since he was 13 months old. He has spoken at a number of TEDx's, a number, many. And in 2015, Daniel spoke at TED Global. And I'm not sure if everyone knows what it is. TEDx is a local. TED Global is the original where TED first went, was, was run. And one and a quarter million people have watched Daniel's presentation that he did at TED, Glo uh, TED Global. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Daniel Kish. I assume you can all see me. They said not to worry about standing on the green marker as long as I stood in the light, which means something to someone. So I have been to about 35 countries, and this is my first visit to Poland. It's, <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Did you ever feel as though you had something inside you that was only waiting for you to give it a chance to come out? Some sort of extra power that you aren't using? That question was put to us many decades ago by Aldous Huxley, author of A Brave New World. So what is this something inside us, this extra power? And what do we need to do to cultivate or release it? Let's think about that for just a moment, if you would. It takes assurance, doesn't it? Confidence, a decision a determination to recognize that we have it and then to figure out how to manifest it, this inner something, this extra power. Now, what happens when we are not so sure of ourselves, when we are surrounded by unknowns, doubts, confusions, not knowing what might happen if we were to execute our decisions, <laughs> or perhaps worse, knowing what would happen, but not knowing how we should respond. It's not so easy to decide, to be determined, to be sure of ourselves when we're not sure of ourselves. So now let's take this one step further what would happen then if you couldn't see, if you were blind? You may have noticed I happen to be in that situation. So my eyes were made by a gifted artist. He made them gorgeous, but he couldn't make them see. Can one even have an extra power without being able to see? From where would that assurance, that determination come if you cannot see? Isn't blindness naturally associated with confusion, doubt, not knowing? Sounds like a trick question. I'm standing right here. But how did I get here? How does a blind man find his way onto a big stage like this one? This is what blindness has meant through time and to this day for still so many people. Struggle, isolation, dependency, restriction, 
poverty. As a blind boy raised in the U.S. in the 60s and 70s, these perspectives that were so embedded in society and culture surrounded me with the message that my question, that my part to play, was less than others, that I mattered less, that freedom of choice, dignity, and purpose did not belong to me. The methods that orientation and mobility instructors use to teach the blind are very outdated and they were created by people who can see. Therefore, these are people who do not rely on these techniques to survive their everyday life. When people are guiding you in Japan, they guide you by the cane, right? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's, like, cool. that's like covering your eyes. <laughs> My parents did not accept those ideas about blindness because those ideas came from sighted people. And what do sighted people know about blindness? They didn't want their son damaged by presumptions. So with their support to strengthen me against this negativity, they let me teach them about blindness. I would have been around 15 to 18 months of age when my parents noticed that I was making little clicking sounds with my tongue. You see, they would have been little clicking sounds. Now they're bigger. Somehow, I seemed to know what was around me. A bit like seeing finding my own way with a freedom and confidence that others found miraculous. But not my parents. They had somehow suspended their beliefs about what I should or shouldn't do as a blind child. So rather casually and without much fanfare, they encouraged me to be just a boy, like other boys. We want you to move out and pay taxes, I heard them say. I think they just wanted me to take care of them in their old age. Unbeknownst to them, we later found that my visual brain, the part used to see, had become active. We know this from brain scans. I walked to my neighborhood school. I played with other kids. I rode my bicycle to my friends' houses. My bicycle. That was my dad's idea. After a bit too much drinking, I remember the arguments. But my mom went along with it. Can you imagine? I did, or attempted, just about everything, with varying results. But I was best at climbing, as are most blind kids who aren't restricted. But for me, climbing wasn't just an activity. It was a mission. A mission inspired by the story, Jack and the Beanstalk. You know the story. Jack and the Beanstalk, plant some beans, a great big huge thing grows really, really tall, and Jack, a boy, climbs this thing and discovers a land in the sky. I related to Jack, and I decided by about the age of four or five that the sky must be touchable. It must be reachable, you just had to climb high enough to get to it. And it made sense because there were sounds coming from the sky. You had airplanes making noises and you had birds making noises and people talk about clouds and the moon hanging in the sky. They must hang from something. So how high do you have to climb to find the something? And so I set out to find that something and I climbed everything I could find to do it. And with my way to see, I found everything I needed. 
And I was about 13 when I climbed the tallest thing yet. It was a eucalyptus tree. Eucalyptus trees are very big and very tall and not so easy to climb. But being small and pretty agile, I was able to climb it, and I was able to get darn near the top. And that means, well, so high, frankly, that I couldn't detect the ground. Which is to say, I couldn't see the ground. Which is to say, I was pretty high, probably 25 or 30 meters. Perhaps the tallest thing for many kilometers in those days. So what I could hear was everything happening all around me. A tapestry of living beings for kilometers in every direction. Birds flying beneath me. And sound radiating all around me. And as far as I could hear, which, as I've said, was pretty far. And the sky went on and on forever. And I realized, as I swayed in the breeze, that was probably, I was probably not going to touch the sky. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something still hung out of reach that was worth reaching for. And if it wasn't the sky calling to me, then what was it? So we fast forward through two master's degrees, <clears throat> research into understanding how I could see without sight and how to train others. Uh, I became the first orientation and mobility specialist to teach other blind people how to get around. I was the first blind person because before me, blind people weren't allowed to teach blind people how to be blind. It is still like that in most countries. Poland is included. So if you're a blind person here, you can't teach other blind people how to be blind. My students began doing things as if they, too, were learning to see. And the media and the press came in waves. I'm a private person. I'm reclusive. I would have been happy living in a cabin in the mountains, well, climbing trees. But here came the press, and letters, and emails, and phone calls. How did they even hear of me? What, how can my child learn this? How can I teach this? How can I find more freedom in my life? Were the questions. So in 2001, I established Visioneers which was not so much about blindness, really, but rather about seeing new forms of vision, new ways to see, and not just for blind people, but for everyone. Because it became clear to me that everyone faces some form of blindness in their lives. And everyone can learn new ways to see better. Visioneers, a division of World Access for the Blind. Our vision is sound. Our method is science. Our results change lives. Never in my life could I have imagined that human beings could learn to see with sound, like bats and dolphins. Bats are really neat animals, and they have to be able to do everything without relying on vision. So the bats emit sounds and do lots of fast computations in the brain about the arrival time of the echoes coming from different distances. And the trick of sonar is to be able to do these computations quickly enough that you can see the scene before you emit the next sound. Bats actually see with sound. A number of research projects have shown that people who are blind um, are in some ways redeploying the visual brain in such a way that they are truly seeing and appreciating the world around them 
and that that visual brain does light up. Our version of echolocation, if you will, flash sonar, means that a flash of sound, in our case, a flash of energy, is used to solicit echoes from the environment that are then used for navigation. For me personally, this has been a really great experience because I've been working on the echolocation of bats uh, and we've only recently started working on echolocation with humans. Now having Daniel here around is like almost being able to talk to a bat. We asked him to draw a picture, to recreate from memory the image he got from nothing more than the sound of clicks. I'll just do a little dash line here. And remember, he had never set foot in this pavilion before today. The accuracy of the image is uncanny. Should I say ta-da? Ta-da! Okay, now let's all get serious. I was first called Batman in the year 2000 by Ripley's Believe It or Not. And the name has stuck. And in languages where they don't say Batman, they, see, they say things like um, Der Fleitermausmann. So the name really has stuck. <laughs> So my bat charity, <clears throat> Visioneers, is a nonprofit which has served thousands of people in exactly 40 countries as of today. Poland marks our 40th country. Hooray! <laughs> the clicking is like communicating with our surroundings. Except in here, where it sounds like I'm in a hall of mirrors. But animal scientists call it interrogating or questioning the environment. Every click asks two questions. Where are you? And what are you? And the more clearly we ask those questions, the more clearly the environment answers back. And I will show you how that works. So <clears throat> I have to show you how to see without sight by asking you to close your eyes, please. So everyone close your eyes. And I'm going to, to show you how to hear changes in the environment, but instead of clicking, I'm going to use a simple sound. I will not change the sound, but you will hear the sound change as I move this flat thing toward me and away from me. Just listen and hear the sound change. Did you all hear that? Yes, no. Excellent, thank you, thank you. But don't open your eyes. Close your eyes, please. Because I have to quiz you now. I said we have to get serious. This is a quiz to determine how well you can see. Think of it as a visual acuity test. Keep your eyes closed. And I'm going to do the exact same thing I just did I'm going to move this thing toward me and away from me as I go shh. But this time, <clears throat> I'd like you all to please tell me to stop when you hear it moving. So when you first hear it moving, just say stop before I bang myself in the face with this thing. Okay, eyes closed. And we're going to relax into this. Don't some people yell stop before I even begin shushing, right? So this is easy going. Just listen and say when. Uh. 
Uh, open your eyes. Okay, that was very close. <laughs> Let's try it again. <laughs> close your eyes. Everyone close your eyes. Now you know what to listen for. <clears throat> Oh, much better. Thank you. Okay, I kind of tricked you that time. I'm sorry. That's the kind of teacher I am. All right. One more little test, and this is just more of a, okay, fine. So he can tell when he's approaching something. He's riding a bicycle. He doesn't run into parked cars. He doesn't run into trees. He doesn't run into stuff. Very well. But how can he tell the difference between a tree and an automobile, or a tree and a bush. So you don't really have to say anything, but you do have to please close your eyes and listen carefully. And you can hear me talking into this thing in front of me. It's a hard thing. It makes my voice bounce back, well, hard, OK? So, Keep your eyes closed and listen to what happens when I change from this hard surface to this much softer surface. Right? So this is a soft surface. Hello. Speaking into my pullover. And going back to the hard surface. Right? Very, very simple. OK. I'm sure you all heard that. I don't even have to ask. But. That is a simple demonstration that shows us that every surface reflects sound differently. And that's what gives us, me, our instructors, our students, that's what gives us, well, a kind of vision. A vision that, that tells us what's around us, that shows us where to go, that helps us to find our way that kind of removes this sort of unknownness, lifts the darkness, if you will. Remember, the visual cortex is active. Now, you've spent just a few seconds learning to see without your eyes. Let's have a look at what can happen after just a few weeks or months using the approaches we developed. 19-year-old Justin Luchar is navigating his way through over a mile of Colorado wilderness, using only his powers of echolocation. Justin has now reached the dense forest section of the course, where he will have to navigate without touching any trees. It's taken Justin less than 30 minutes to walk over a mile through an incredibly testing environment using only the power of sound. What are you seeing? Well, so I know that there's an object, and I know that this is a really solid object with divots in it. And I know that because when the sound comes back, it comes back very clearly and it shakes. And I know that it's harder than wood. So I'm going to bet that this is a rock, and... Oh, he got it! it. Moved it. I did, huh? Victor is five years old, and it was the first time for him to have a mobility and echolocation training. So he did not have his own white cane. And we had to make do with my cane, which was too long for him. Oh, yeah, it's a tree. Where did you get this bathroom? Since Victor was new to echolocation, I thought of teaching him echolocation by clapping against a book. Okay, I got something very solid here. Very solid here? Yeah. Okay. Um, tall or short? Tall. Taller than me. And you're looking for? A tall, solid object. Tall, solid object. <laughs> And I touched it. There yeah. it is. All right, you found it. <laughs>
it's opening up you know, each day that we do the training, so to now be able to tell the difference between something that's pretty solid versus something which maybe isn't so dense or is a bit sparser, it's just it's absolutely unbelievable. You know, I was just very impressed at myself there. <laughs> I think it's just, the whole technique's just fantastic. Oh, okay, lift yourself up. I, I got you, I got you. Remember, I promise you cannot fall. Okay, I'm up. There we go. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna come up. Yeah, we're all gonna get together. You're doing great, yeah. right, me? Where am I? Okay. Try, now, you get, give us your power click. See if you can hear the building still. No, no building. This looks more like a. His personality sand. drives him to know, to understand, to experience, and he has no fear. And he doesn't mind a bit of mishap. I mean, I've seen him crash and burn on a number of occasions, and it does not phase him. He just doesn't care. All right, here's a hill. Follow me. All right. Those are pretty powerful combination of characteristics that will just drive a person forward. Yep, yeah, we're heading towards the building. I have no vision at all. I have no light perception, and I've been this way since I was born. I worked with her for seven days. She went from anxiety attacks about leaving her front door alone. By the end of those seven days, it was getting to the mall on her own and enjoying doing her own shopping. Since learning echolocation, I now have true choice. I'm not abjectly terrified of traveling independently. Oh, what is it? Let's go check it out. These skills are things that blind people don't typically have access to. And it's, it's the most empowering feeling when you've got somebody who's with you and who is also blind and who's saying, yeah, you can do this, you can do this. It's, it's one of the most empowering experiences I've ever had in my life. And it's not like somebody comes and then all of a sudden you can do everything. You have to keep working at it. I was just flabbergasted. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing because I didn't think that was ever, ever possible. It's not a matter of enjoying it more or less. It's about enjoying it differently. You know, it's, it, it's enjoying it through different vision, through another lens. It's hugely gratifying to us to see the transition, especially when you consider two weeks ago, he couldn't take a step on his own. We have shown him that you can make your own decisions. You can do what you want to do. You can go where you want to go. Most importantly, what we have given Rio is hope. Like, if human beings can see with sound, what else is possible? Echolocation gave me real connection to my physical environment, which then gave me greater freedom to my social environment. The better I was at mobility, the easier it was to make friends and to do things with people. Everybody has something to learn from echolocation, and that is that we all are capable of so much more than we previously thought. We are really living in a new era of exploring the question, what can blind people see? I mean, it's sort of a temporary state because now we can actually teach our brains to image acoustically. People often ask me, Brian, do you wish you could see? And my response is, I already can. That's our hope for Hamoudi, is that he's gonna, as an adult, he's just gonna be able to just power through life like he does now, but you know, at a, basically without anybody helping him. People get stereotypes from what they think. So what I do is, I show people that they're wrong and I do my normal stuff, and that is blown to pieces of a bunch of stereotypes. I go out there and I run through them, so go with your heart, get out there, do something, you know? Don't just sit there thinking you can't do anything, because you can. Like if you guys can see with your eyes, and we um, can see with our ears. Three, two, one. Go! This obstacle course is not just poles. It is a goal. And the bigger the goal, the more obstacles you face. And on the other side of that goal is victory. Un Guinness World Record. Stop! 
È stato bellissimo vederlo qua. Si se puede! Si se puede! Si yes, se puede! You yes, you can! That's my cue. If human beings can learn to see with sound, what else is possible? All of these folks are totally blind, and all of them able to see. Juan Ruiz, the guy who set the world record, the yes, you can guy, si se puede. 11 years old when I began working with him. Now he's one of our blind instructors. Blind people aren't allowed to teach in most countries. The young man walking through the snowy forest only had his eyes removed a few months before that was filmed. Also, one of our instructors, now totally blind. It's hard to use your eyes to see when they are made by an artist, unless that artist is God. The woman who said she was paralyzed by fear is one of the few blind choir directors in the world. Her husband fell very ill after I worked with her. She took on all the responsibilities of caring for her family with her new found freedom and abilities. And the young boy who scored the touchdown shot in the face at point-blank range by a terrorist in Iraq when he was two years old. And now treated like every other member of his football team. No special accommodations are made for him. That touchdown was not staged as much as he may have made it look, because he is able to outrun most players on the field. He tackles. He is tackled. <laughs> he is regarded with full respect as an equal contributor and a damn good sportsman, and he's half the size of many of the players on that field. I didn't teach any of them how to do any of these extraordinary and ordinary things. I myself have not done any <laughs> of these things. I have not set a world record, I have certainly not scored a touchdown, and I do not raise a family. All I have done is reach with them for their own freedom, on their own terms, beyond anything stopping them, with a new way to see. For me, this is reaching for the sky. They choose for themselves how to realize their own extra power, as we all can. What if every blind person could set a world record if they want, or play football? they want? What if any of us could just do what we want? Hamoudi, the touchdown kid, tells us, don't think you can't do anything, because you can. Juan, Mr. Guinness, proclaims, yes, you can. I think that is the inner something, the extra power, the power of can. They can. I can. You can. We can. And when we all recognize that power of can within ourselves and each other, then together, I think, we all can create a truly brave new world. We can. Thank you. <laughs>